All right, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm George Buman with the Yellowstone Life, and welcome to the Yellowstone Summit. Today, it's my honor to have Jeff Henry with us today, and we're both in person. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for joining me, Jeff. And Jeff has been a fixture here in the Yellowstone ecosystem for what, it's almost 50 years. Uh, approaching that? 50 years. Yeah. And I admire Jeff's work. He's he's written perhaps or been a part of a dozen or more books. Yeah, 12 or 15 books, something like that. Yeah. yeah. And um, more than someone who just uh, enjoys writing about it and learning about things from a distance, Jeff's really been someone who's in, interested in engaging directly with the places he is and chooses to be in. And of course, Yellowstone's the number one on his list too, as it is for us. And so um, one of the areas that Jeff's really uh, dug into that we wanted to feature here on the summit was John Coulter's trip through the park, um, generally considered the, the first European to have seen Yellowstone Park. We wanted to learn more about that, but especially from the angle where um, you know, it's it's easy to see a line on a map, but to understand exactly what that might have been like to actually do is is right up Jeff's alley and, and definitely our interest here, too. So I'll let Jeff re introduce more uh, of himself and then dive into John Coulter in Yellowstone. Well, thanks, thanks a lot, George. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my name is Jeff Henry, and I have been here for uh, it'll be 47 years this coming May. Uh, you could say that I'm a Yellowstone junkie. It's one of my principal passions in life. Uh, I consider myself very fortunate that I've been able to be here for as long as I have. And I'm also fortunate because I've been able to work a wide variety of jobs in Yellowstone over the years. I started out being a fishing guide on Yellowstone Lake. And I went from that to being a maintenance man, a truck driver, a heavy laborer, a tour guide. I've researched coyotes. I've researched grizzly bears. I've been a park ranger. Um, one of my bigger passions within my general Yellowstone passion is I love to shovel snow off roofs in Yellowstone. And I know that most <laughs> of my friends think I'm eccentric, maybe even <laughs> silly, but whenever I talk about it, I always add that I think that everybody should have something that turns them on as much as clearing snow off roofs in Yellowstone turns me on. And I still do it even at this age. I'm about to begin my 46th winter, I guess, in Yellowstone. Mm. Um, I've missed uh, a lot of time. Some of those winters, I went to law enforcement school for the Park Service uh, one winter, missed most of the winter. But I got back in late February that year, and even that year, I managed to squeeze in a little bit of winter keeping work. So with that said, I'd like to bring up the first slide. Well, specifically, we're here to talk about John Coulter today. And I'd like to show a few slides of myself to better introduce myself, to illustrate the fact that I have spent a lot of time in Yellowstone. Stone. I think I do. Without sounding like I'm boasting, I do have a lot of perspective that I think uh, is fairly rare. I've spent a lot of time in the park in the winter, so I have special insights into winter, I think. This is what I've done for, I guess, 45 winters so far. Take snow off roofs in Yellowstone. Um, this was another shot uh, of, a, of me working to clear snow off a roof at Old Faithful in uh, 1997, which was a record winter. Uh, you can see that I'm about six feet tall, so you can judge how deep that snow is. Another job that I did in my years in Yellowstone is I worked about eight seasons for the Interagency Grizzly Bear Study Team. Uh, most of that time I spent doing a winter kill carcass survey in the Firehole Basin. Uh, 95, 98% of the time I did the job by myself. On this particular day, uh, a man named David Matson, who uh, worked for the Bear Study for a long time, long time himself, came out with me. I got this shot of him with a winter killed elk in Biscuit Basin. I also worked bear management for the National Park Service. Um, this is a picture from 1984 where a bear suffocated on his radio collar when it was uh, tranquilized. And this ranger on the left, the, the man who's uh, prone, was named Dave Spurdies. Uh, and obviously he's doing mouth to mouth resuscitation on the bear, it was unsuccessful. Uh, I also worked as a firefighter for the Park Service, and in 1988, I was one of two official photographers who were assigned to shoot photographs of the fires for the park archives. There's pictures uh, near Alum Creek and Hayden Valley. Obviously, the fires are going great guns. I was also a law enforcement ranger for a number of years. This is a backcountry trip I took to uh, Upper Pelican Valley with my good friend, Mark Marshall, who was another longtime Yellowstone Ranger. 
We're at the Fern Lake Patrol cabin in the picture, of course. You can see the sign there. Great trip. Mark's a great guy. And that's another thing I'd like to throw in. I've not only been fortunate to have been able to spend as much time as I have in Yellowstone, and I've also been fortunate, as I said earlier, to have the variety of jobs I've had, but I've also been very privileged to have worked with and known and interacted with an awful lot of really great people. And Mark Marshall is certainly one of those people. Uh, those people out there in the audience who know me also know that I spent a great many years uh, working as a freelance photographer, uh, specializing, of course, in Yellowstone subjects. This is a picture of mine that I took on a, a morning at Old Faithful. That is Old Faithful Geyser. It wasn't a particularly cold morning. It was only about 30 below, but it was cold enough to make the eruption of the geyser dramatic. We're here specifically to talk about John Coulter, so we'll... We'll move in that direction. John Coulter was born about 1775. We don't know exactly when he was born, but it was about 1775 he was born in Virginia. At an early age, he and his family moved to Kentucky. Um, he was about 28 years old in 1803, the fall of 1803, when Lewis and Clark were putting together um, their crew to go with him on their fabled trip to the West Coast. And you can see here that... Uh, after spending the winter in a winter camp across the Mississippi River from St. Louis, where Lewis and Clark, Clark gathered their, their men and their equipment in preparation for their trip to the West Coast. Uh, that's where John Coulter spent the winter. Um, and in the spring, you can see this entry from Captain Clark's journal dated April 1st, 1804, when he listed the, the uh, roster of the men who had made the final cut to be included in the permanent party to go up the Missouri River and go to the West Coast. And this is how John Coulter was first introduced to the American West. Uh, he was included in a group that Lewis and Clark and just about everybody who's ever written about Lewis and Clark like to refer to as the nine young men from Kentucky. Part of Lewis and Clark's crew uh, was recruited from uh, the ranks of soldiers who were already in the United States Army. Others were recruited because of their frontier background, and that would certainly include John Coulter and the other nine young men from Kentucky. So on May 14th, 1804, Lewis and Clark embarked on their great trek to the West Coast. They left uh, St. Louis and started up the Missouri River. The principal objective of their trip was to ascend, this, these are uh, President Jefferson's words that he passed on to Captain Lewis in uh, a document dated um, in 1803, eight, uh, summer of 1803, but they were to ascend the Mississippi River to its to its source and then find the most practical route across the mountains into streams that were flowing west into the Pacific Ocean. And this is an image uh, by the great Western artist Frederick Remington of the Lewis and Clark crew ascending the Missouri River. Uh, Lewis and Clark got as far up the Missouri River that first summer as uh, West Central, what's now West Central North Dakota. They spent the winter uh, uh, with Indian neighbors, one tribe called the Mandans and another called the Adatsas. Um, they spent a great deal of the winter interviewing those Indians about the country farther to the West, which pretty much was country that no white person had ever seen. This is a painting by another great Western artist, uh, a very sophisticated artist named Charlie Russell. Uh, Russell took a great deal of artistic license with this painting. Uh, this, this incident happened, but it didn't happen in the scene that Russell has painted. I think the painting does serve to give us a feeling of what it was like in a, in a human sense to be there with Lewis and Clark. It's the inside of a hut that was characteristic of where these Indians in North Dakota lived. There's a sidebar story here that I think is worth telling. It doesn't have all that much to do with Lewis and Clark. But this Indian in the center of the picture was named One-Eye. He was an Adatsa. The Adatsas were known for being fierce warriors. And this uh, gentleman, One-Eye, was known for being particularly fierce. Uh, every, it seems like everybody was afraid of the terrible One-Eye. One-Eye had the right attitude, in my opinion, toward the white people. He didn't trust them, and he didn't like them. And for some reason, he thought that Captain Clark's slave, Captain Clark did own a personal servant whose name was York, and Clark did take York on this great trip to the West Coast. But when I thought that the white people were trying to pull the wool over his eyes and that no such thing as a black person existed. So when I spit on his fingers and tried to rub the, 
black paint off York's chest. Of course, he was unsuccessful. This painting is also good because it does show some of the pr principal characters that were involved in the Lewis and Clark story. On the right side of the frame, you can see Lewis and Clark. Uh, just to the viewer's left of Lewis and Clark, you can see uh, Sacagawea and her husband slash owner, uh, Toussaint Charbonneau. The reason I included this slide is to give some idea of how the winter went when Lewis and Clark spent the winter in what's now North Dakota with the Indians, the winter of 1804, 1805. They did interview the Indians about the conditions and the landscape, the geography farther west. And some of that information must have percolated down to the men of the crew, including Lewis and Clark. And admittedly, I'm spending quite a bit of time on the background, John Coulter's trek through Yellowstone. But I think it's important to set the context uh, to know the background that was involved before Coulter set out on that fabled trek across what's now Yellowstone Park. In the spring of 1805, Lewis and Clark left the Mandan villages in North Dakota and continued their ascent of the Missouri River. Uh, they left the Mandan villages on April 7th, 1805. Uh, they made their way up the Missouri River to the Three Forks of the Missouri and beyond. They ascended the Jefferson River, one of the Three Forks of the Missouri, to its source. All along, uh, Lewis and Clark realized that at some point they were going to have to make a, a major portage over the, the crest of the Rocky Mountains to go from the headwaters of the Missouri to some stream that was flowing west toward the Pacific Ocean. And to do that, to make that trek across the mountains, they were going to have to procure horses from the Indians. And it was fortunate for them that they had Sacagawea with them. There, were, there was quite a bit of good fortune involved with uh, Lewis and Clark. They were very capable men and they had a very capable crew but there was a lot of good fortune involved too they did encounter a group of shoshone indians the tribe uh, sacagawea had had come from uh, sacagawea was captured by the adatsa indians in a raid that the adatsas made in circa 1799 1800 something like that they captured sacagawea and some other shoshone girls at the three forks of the missouri and took them back to north dakota to serve as slaves there was a good friend of Sacagawea's who was captured the same time that Sacagawea was captured. And this is another sidebar story, but it's worth telling, I think. Uh, the other girl's name was Nyanuki. Uh, Sacagawea stayed on in the uh, Adatsa villages on the Missouri and North Dakota. Nyanuki wasn't having any of it. She escaped from those villages. And as an 11-year-old girl, she made the 800-mile or so trek back to her homeland in... Uh, what's now Western Montana, maybe even into Idaho. And she found her way back to her own people, somehow dodging grizzly bears, dodging enemy warriors, protecting herself from the weather, finding enough to eat, but she did it. And then coincidence of coincidence, one of the first bands of Shoshones that Lewis and Clark encountered included not only Sacagawea's brother, but this woman, Naya Nookie. And this is a painting that Charlie Russell did of the reunion between Sacagawea and Nyanuki. This is Captain Lewis looking on. Uh, Toussaint Charbonneau is in the middle right of the frame explaining what's going on. One of the Shoshones on horseback is using the Indian Sign Language. So Lewis and Clark went from there. They did make it across the Rocky Mountains, of course. They did make it down to the Columbia River. Uh, they did build a fort called Fort Clatsop, named after uh, local Indians at the mouth of the Columbia. And, uh, and they spent the winter of 1805-1806 there. In the spring of 1806, they headed back east, had to head back home. They managed to cross the Rocky Mountains. It's a, a pertinent point, again, um, set, trying to set the background here. They divided their crew in western Montana, near where Missoula, Montana is now. The bulk of the crew went with Lewis back down the Missouri River. A smaller portion of the crew went with Captain Clark. To make a long story short, they went down the Yellowstone River. One of the dramatic incidents that took place on the Yellowstone River in, uh, I think it was August 1st, 1806, is that Clark was, in his words, uh, Clark was obliged to lay to on the side of the Yellowstone River to allow an enormous bison herd to cross the river. He was obliged to lay to for an hour for this big herd to pass. Um, and again, this is a, a little bit, I digress a little bit from the John Coulter story, but this illustrates to me how many bison there were on the Great Plains in 1806. Not only did this big herd arrest uh, Clark's passage down the river, he noted in his journal that down the river beyond the first herd, he could see two more herds crossing the Yellowstone. 
at the same time, and he described them as being as numerous as the first. My point here is that because Clark and a portion of the party went down the Yellowstone River, they did gain knowledge about the Yellowstone River, firsthand knowledge that undoubtedly was passed on to the other portion of the party, including John Coulter, when they finally linked up uh, at the mouth of the Yellowstone later in August of 1806. I think that's going to be important later on in my my narrative that uh, Clark and his portion of the of the party did have firsthand experience on the Yellowstone River. Lewis and his uh, portion of the party and Clark and his group reunited near the mouth of the Yellowstone River on the Missouri in August of 1806. And then they proceeded on, to use their favorite phrase, down the Missouri River, intending to stop at the Mandan villages again on their way home to say hi to their friends and to accomplish some other objectives that I won't go into. But on their way down the Missouri, they encountered two trappers who were headed upstream, an individual named Joseph Dixon and another named Forrest Hancock. They uh, interacted with those, with those guys, had a conversation, caught up on a little news that had happened in the East since they had left. And then they parted ways. Lewis and Clark headed back down to the Mandan villages. They thought that Dixon and Hancock were going to con continue up the up the Missouri River. Their ultimate plan was to trap the Yellowstone that coming winter. Well, Lewis and Clark got to the Mandan villages, and uh, here come uh, Dixon and Hancock catching up, trying to catch up with the crew, with uh, the Lewis and Clark Corps of Discovery. And the reason they turned around and came back to catch up with the with the Corps is they wanted to inquire of Lewis and Clark whether they could hire away one of Lewis and Clark's crew to go with them for obvious reasons. Somebody who had seen the country upriver. And it turns out that uh, it turned out that uh, that individual that they were able to hire away from Lewis and Clark's crew was John Coulter. And you can see in this journal entry from Captain Clark on August 15th, 1806, Lewis and Clark agreed to John Coulter's request for an early release. And so John Coulter did form a partnership with Joseph Dixon and Forrest Hancock, and the three of them carried on back up river on the Missouri River. They went up the Yellowstone River and spent the, the winter of 1805, 1806, somewhere up the Yellowstone River. They ascended as far as what we call Sunlight Basin to the east of Yellowstone Park. That's not confirmed, but they definitely did spend the winter of 1806, 1807, somewhere in the upper Yellowstone. This is another bit of evidence that uh, Clark went down the Yellowstone River that you can still see today. It's a national monument, a place called Pompey's Pillar about 30 or 40 miles downriver east of uh, today's Billings, Montana. It's pretty cool to stand a few feet away from a rock that uh, the great Captain Clark engraved on July 25th, 1806. Another reason I put this slide in um, is to point out the fact that at least 14 different times are recorded in the Lewis and Clark Journal, Lewis or Clark or both, and usually a substantial number of their party engrave their names on rocks or carve their names into trees. John Coulter is never mentioned specifically as having done so, but he was with groups, subgroups that did so. So he at least had the example of seeing this done. And that's going to come into play later on in my narrative. On their way back down the Missouri River in August of 1806, Meriwether Lewis had the misfortune of going elk hunting one day with a nearsighted member of the party named Pierre Cruzat. And Pierre Cruzat accidentally shot Meriwether Lewis. He mistook Lewis's buckskin clothing for the color of an elk and fired a shot at Lewis. Captain Lewis was hit directly in the buttocks. And that wound laid, uh, it was, uh, to use Lewis's own words, the stroke was severe. And Lewis was laid up for a period of uh, several weeks as he recuperated. And because he couldn't do any sort of physical labor, he took over the journaling responsibilities primarily. And there was a period of time in the journals when he wrote for Clark, and those, those journal entries are under Clark's name, but many of them were written by Lewis. And this particular passage I've displayed here is from August 3rd, 1806, as you can see. And Lewis, writing for Clark, is reviewing what they have learned about the Yellowstone River. He called it a delightful river here in the first line. One reason I've included this, another uh, bit of background is at the time of Lewis and Clark, especially before Lewis and Clark made their trip, there was a belief among the most learned people in the United States that there was a fundamental height of land somewhere in the Rocky Mountains from which all the major rivers 
of the West emanated. Even the great Mr. Jefferson, one of the greatest minds of his time or any other time, subscribed to that belief that there was a pyramidal height of land somewhere in the mountains where all the major rivers of the West originated. And if you read that first sentence in this passage, Lewis writes, this delightful river, etc., it has its extreme sources with the North River and the Rocky Mountains on the confines of New Mexico. I bring that up because there's another fundamental point that was brought out by the famous historian Bernard de Voto in his book, uh, The Course of Empire, and that all through the ex exploration of the Americas, explorers would always try to find something in particular. They were always moving to find new country, to find something that nobody had ever discovered. And whatever it was that they were looking for had been located just beyond where they turned back. They almost saw it. One of the best examples I can think of is uh, Baranzano was sailing along the coast of what's uh, now North Carolina. And he looked across the Outer Banks and he could see the mainland of North America. And he was certain that that mainland that he could see on the other side of the Outer Banks was Asia. That uh, phenomenon con continued on to Lewis and Clark's time and. They wanted to believe that New Mexico was not very far from the Yellowstone River. And again, that's a fundamental point to keep in mind. Uh, there are several other tidbits in this passage that are, would be really interesting to anybody who's interested in Yellowstone. I've highlighted that uh, two sections in red. It, the, the first section in red reads, the Indians inform us, etc., that a good road passes up the Yellowstone River to its extreme source, from whence it is but a short distance to the Spanish settlements. There's another one about a considerable fall somewhere on the Yellowstone River in this passage. He writes, there's a considerable fall somewhere on the Yellowstone River, somewhere within the mountains. So from the Indians, obviously, they, they apparently heard about uh, what we call the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone and the Upper and Lower Falls which I find fascinating. But the point here I want to make relative to John Coulter is that the dogma of the times was that New Mexico was not very far from the Yellowstone River. John Coulter went up the Yellowstone River for the winter of 1806-1807 with Joseph Dixon and Forrest Hancock. And somewhere, wherever they stayed, somehow they had a falling out that winter. And come spring and early summer of 1807, our John Coulter started back down the Yellowstone and Missouri River systems by himself in a canoe. And by chance, he met a large brigade of fur trappers led by a man named Manuel Lisa somewhere near the mouth of the Platte River. And this was a painting by an artist named Michael Haynes, who specializes in uh, Lewis and Clark subjects. This fur trader, Manuel Lisa, had recruited several other me uh, members of the Lewis and Clark expedition to go with him on his trapping venture. And the reasons for that would probably be obvious. He wanted people who had seen the Western country, knew something about it, had met some of the Indian tribes. Uh, among others, uh, the Lewis and Clark veterans with Manuel Lisa were George Druyard, Peter Weiser, John Potts, John Collins, and there may have been some others that I can't remember off the top of my head. But this is a, a scene of the reunion of John Coulter with some of his friends from the Lewis and Clark trip. One is sprinting toward Coulter to, to greet him. Manuel Lisa managed to talk John Coulter into turning around and going back up the Missouri River again. This Again, this is the summer of 1807. So Coulter goes back up the river with Manuel Lisa. This is a painting of Manuel Lisa himself. He was a fur trader, interesting individual. He was born in Cuba, came to what is now the United States, spent a lot of time in New Orleans, and then he went up the Mississippi River and became an entrepreneur in the uh, fur trading business in St. Louis. He was not well-liked. He was often referred to as a scoundrel. I think part of the reason that he was disliked is he was uh, something of an interloper into the fur trading business. Was, which was largely dominated in St. Louis by one large family, the Chodo family. He wasn't liked for that reason. He was also an energetic hustler. One of the famous quotes from Manuel Issa that has come down to us uh, had to do with his trip up the Missouri River in 1807. He had heard reports from Lewis and Clark about how many fur-bearing animals like otters and especially beavers and others there were in the upper reaches of the Missouri River system. The quote that comes down to us from Manuel Lisa at that time was, I can go a long way while others are making up their minds whether to stay or go. And that probably accounts for some of the reason he wasn't well liked in St. Louis. After uh, meeting John Coulter at the mouth of the Platte River on the Missouri, Lisa's expedition continued upriver, took a left turn into the Yellowstone where the Yellowstone meets uh, 
the Missouri and what's today extreme western North Dakota, went another 170 miles up the Yellowstone River to the mouth of the Bighorn. And then Manuel Lisa commenced, immediately commenced building a fort in that triangle of land between the two rivers. It's not known exactly where the fort was. Uh, no one has ever been able to find the rem remains of the fort. It was probably fairly recessed from the joint of the river, the joining of the two rivers, back over against those bluffs. In my opinion, he started immediately working on the fort uh, for obvious reasons. It was October by the time they got there. Winter in that part of the country, this part of the country, especially back in those days, was close at hand. He wanted to get the get shelter up for his men and his equipment and his supplies. And he always also wanted to build protection against any Indians, I think. There is some evidence not confirmed that he encountered a group of Crow Indians on his way up the Yellowstone. There's even one account that the Indians he met helped drag his boats up the Yellowstone River, uh, that they attached ropes to their horses and used the horses to pull the barges up the river. John Coulter was still part of the... Uh, of the of the group here at the junction of the two rivers. In my opinion, I think that uh, Lisa probably did not uh, impress Coulter into the crew building the fort. I think he probably sent Coulter out on his famous trek right off the bat, again, because of the, the change of seasons was coming. The Coulter trek through what's now Yellowstone Park is re really well known. Lesser known is the fact that Lisa also dispatched two other veterans from the Lewis and Clark expedition on similar trips. He dispatched George Driard to the country east of where Coulter trekked, and he dispatched Peter Weiser to the country west of what's now Yellowstone Park. George Driard scouted out the Bighorn River, uh, the Tongue River, the upper reaches of uh, the Bighorn River all the way up to uh, at least as far as where Thermopolis, Wyoming is now. And we know this because George Driard left a sketch map. Uh, George Driard was uh, a, a special individual. He was the son of a French trapper and a Shawnee Indian woman. He was considered the most important member of the Lewis and Clark trip, the most important hand they had. There's a great passage from Captain Clark's journal uh, that reads something like, uh, were it not for the exertions of this most excellent hunter, I scarcely know how he would survive. Poorly, I think. Drew Yard was uh, valuable in other respects. He was a master of the Indian Sign Language. He was fearless. He was good with horses. This is a, a painting of George Drew Yard done by Michael Haynes, who specializes in Lewis and Clark subjects. Michael Haynes is as good a researcher is, as he is a painter. So there is no known likeness of George Drew Yard, but based on the research that Michael Haynes probably did for this painting, that's probably as good as we're going to do. Peter Weiser was also a, a valued member of the expedition, and he was sent, long story short, he was sent up the Yellowstone River all the way to what we know as Bozeman Pass. He apparently crossed Bozeman Pass, went to the Three Forks of the Missouri, ascended the Madison River, Cross what we know as Reynolds Pass, and it's 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 certain that he went as far as the Upper Snake River. Uh, there's a a river that appears on one of Captain Clark's map that's uh, named the uh, Wiser River. There's also a letter from a fur trader named Lu Reuben Lewis, who was Captain Meriwether Lewis's brother, who was involved in the fur trade in what's now Montana, and he specifically mentions that Wiser was in the Upper Snake River Valley at about the same time that Coulter made his famous trek. Again, Drew Yard scouted the rivers out in the plains country to the to the east of the mountains, uh, especially the Bighorn and the Tongue Rivers. And just uh, as another sidebar, I'm fond of sidebars. Uh, one of his favorite uh, streams that he encountered was a stream called the Little Bighorn that would gain fame about 70 years later. In the distance in this photograph, this aerial photograph of the site of Manuel Lisa's fort, you can see a low rise of mountains, those would be the Prior Mountains, named uh, by Captain Clark for another member of the Lewis and Clark Expedition, Sergeant Nathaniel Pryor. This is uh, an engraving on the rock and the bluff from the previous picture. The bluffs there beyond those tilled fields uh, where Lisa's post was located. Whether this is authentic or not, I can't say. And in general, I want to state uh, at this point that uh, we will never, almost certainly will never know for sure what Coulter did, where exactly he went on his famous trek. What I have to say are my own opinions, 
um, my own speculations, to be honest. I will say that I have spent an awful lot of time reading and researching uh, Coulter in the literature that's available about him. And more than that, not to sound like I'm boasting at all, but I don't think anybody else has spent as much time in, in Yellowstone Park, especially in the winter, thinking, contemplating about John Coulter, where he went, uh, what he did, and taking into account uh, the landscapes, water courses, uh, snow deposition, distribution of winter wildlife. That's my claim to fame when it comes to John Coulter. I don't have academic credentials, but I do have that firsthand experience, especially in the winter. I've been very active in the winter for 45 years now. Now, another general point I want to bring up is uh, the Blackfeet Indians. This particular Blackfoot's name was Iron Shirt, a really cool name, I think. Iron Shirt was a prototypical Blackfoot warrior, and you have to I don't think any thinking, feeling person could look at this painting by Carl Bodmer and think anything other than the fact that uh, Iron Shirt was a, a very tough dude indeed. And then to think that there were several thousand Blackfoot warriors, warriors much like Iron Shirt. I mean, take a look at this guy. He's got grizzly bear claws woven into his hair. It looks like maybe a dead weasel woven into his hair. His face is painted black, which is what Plain Indians often did when they went to war. And we know that this fellow Iron Shirt led an ambush that attacked a, a band of trappers near where Billings, Montana is today in 1823. He ambushed a fur caravan that was headed by a man named Robert Jones and another man named Michael Emil. Jones and Emil were both killed in the attack along with five of their men. Eleven years later, a famous artist named Carl Bodmer met Iron Shirt on the Missouri River, 1834, and painted this picture. My point is that the influence of the Blackfeet Indians was a major shaping influence in the history of the American West. Uh, in short, they diverted American travel, American activities to the south of their homeland for decades in the 1800s. The Blackfoot homeland, the Blackfeet homeland was primarily in central northern Montana and in the southern reaches of the prairie provinces of Canada. And that's a general reason why Manuel Lisa John Coulter and the others were active from the Yellowstone River to the south and not the Yellowstone River to the north and not the Missouri River at all. Now, as far as John Coulter's trek, this is pretty much the only written reference we have to what Coulter did when he made his famous trek across what I think he crossed what's now Yellowstone Park. Most people agree with that. This passage that begins, this man with a pack of 30 pounds, etc., traveled upwards of 500 miles by himself on snowshoes. I have, I, I can say with certainty that this this passage is an error in some counts. It, the biggest error that he compressed, uh, that this Brackenridge fellow compressed about three or four years of Coulter's activities into one year. Please bear that in mind as we go along. The other primary bit of evidence we have that tells us something about where Coulter went and when he did it is Captain Clark's master map of 1814. Clark, uh, William Clark w uh, was gifted cartographically. Uh, he drew almost all the maps that uh, were drawn on the Lewis and Clark expedition. And in 1810, he compiled all those maps along with information that he had gleaned from people like John Coulter and George Driard and uh, Peter Weiser and others and incorporated into a, in all that information into a master map of 1810. He revised the map again in 1814. This is his master map version of 1814. It covers a, a broad range of country. You can see that it's it's really quite accurate. It's very accurate along Lewis and Clark's route. Clark's depictions of the Rocky Mountains, he has them depicted primarily as long ridges. And that's characteristic of the Appalachians. Like think of the Blue Ridge Mountains, basically one long ridge. And we know now that uh, the Rocky Mountains are not that simplistic. But that is the way that Clark drew this map. The next image is a blow up of the same map, the Ma Clark's master map of 1814. And we're, there are limitations here uh, because of Zoom. Uh, we can't really blow the map up as much as I would like, but it's still possible to see what Clark labeled as Coulter's route in 1807. And you can see the dotted line that outlines Coulter's route through what's now Yellowstone Park, down into the Teton area, and then back to Manuel Lisa's post at the mouth of the Bighorn. That's where 
uh, John Coulter commenced his trip, and that's where he went back in uh, the spring of 1808. One of the mysteries that most historians uh, have not solved, apparently, and again, I'm not boasting in any way, is that Clark's depiction of John Coulter's route doesn't start exactly at the Bighorns. It starts, as you can see on this blow up of the map, along uh, Pryor Creek. Again, there's name for Sergeant Nathaniel Pryor of the Lewis and Clark expedition. It doesn't lead directly from Lisa's post to that where the, the hash marks begin partway up Pryor's Fork. What I think is pertinent is the fact that uh, George Druyard drew his own sketch map of the country that he traversed in the winter of 1807, 1808, the same winter that Coulter was doing his thing in what's now Yellowstone. Coulter's sketch map does show his route beginning from Lisa's post and progressing up the Yellowstone and then pretty much matching Coulter's route as depicted on Clark's master map of 1814. As I said earlier, Druyard was dispatched to scout the country to to the east of the mountains, also to make contact with any Indians he came across to inform them of Lisa's new trading post. I think it's reasonable to assume that Druyard and Coulter and probably Peter Weiser started their trek up the Yellowstone together. And therefore, I think it's reasonable to assume that Coulter accompanied Druyard away from the Yellowstone and ascended Friars Fork with Druyard. I'd like to add at this point that you can find this map online, type in the Samuel Lewis, William Clark master map of 1814, and you can access it through the Library of Congress. The version that's available online is very high re resolution. You can you can zoom in and, and see a lot of detail that you can't see here. Coulter's route basically makes a loop, but it also has peculiar duplication of route between the Clark's Fork, the Upper Clark's Fork River, and the Shoshone River, the river that we call the Shoshone on Clark's map, it will show as the Stinking Water River. It's my contention that Coulter, probably in the company with in company with uh, George Druyard, ventured to the forks of the Shoshone and there met some wintering Indians, probably Crows and Shoshones. That spot is an ideal wintering spot. It's in the Chinook zone. There was also a considerable thermal area between the forks of the Shoshone and down downstream on the main fork of the Shoshone. Uh, it's still there today, uh, at least the, the portion wall on the main fork of the Shoshone near the Cody Rodeo grounds. You can still smell the thermals there and you can see them if you look down into the canyon of the Shoshone. In uh, Coulter's time, there was a considerable thermal area between the two forks of the Shoshone. That site is inundated by the Buffalo Bill Reservoir now, so you can't see that site anymore. But there are several historic accounts that uh, this describe that spot as a wintering spot for uh, Indians. And here I have a William H. Jackson photograph of the forks of the Shoshone in the 1870s, long before the Buffalo Bill Dam was built. And you can see that Jackson and his party thought that the site was a good one for a camp. You can see their tents right there at the forks of the Shoshone. Now, going back to the uh, blow up of the Clark map, I think what happened, this is my personal opinion, and again, we will probably never know for sure. Driard and Coulter went to that Indian camp and procured Indian guides and horses. They both knew the Shoshones from their experience with Lewis and Clark. They probably knew some of the Shoshone language. They had spent enough time with the Shoshones to know some, some amount of the language. They both knew the sign language, the uh, lingua franca of uh, the Western Indians. I think that Coulter, as best he could, describe where he wanted to go, uh, probably to one of the, a south flowing river. And again, mm -hmm. if you remember, I, I described this uh, idea of the pyramidal height of land. He was probably looking for a south flowing river that would take him to the Spanish colonies in New Mexico. Uh, I think I forgot to mention earlier that that was one of Manuel Lisa's primary motivations. He was a fur trader, but he was also very keen on establishing trade with Santa Fe and the other colonies, settlements in New Mexico for a variety of reasons that I won't go into. It wasn't possible at this point in time, 1807, 1808, to make a direct uh, trade between St. Louis 
in the Spanish settlements. I think that, well, it's, it's well established that Lisa was very interested in establishing such a trade. And I think that he thought that by locating his post at the mouth of the Bighorn River, which all the information he had at his disposal indicated was not that far from the Spanish settlements, that he could make an end run on the obstructions that were in place uh, blocking the trade directly between St. Louis and Santa Fe. Another aside is that this was about 14 years or so before the establishment of what we know as the Santa Fe Trail. So I think he sent his emissaries out, Weiser, Coulter, and Driard, to make contact with local Indians to tell them that he had a post at the mouth of the Bighorn where they could come and trade. He wanted those guys to go out and scout the country, and he was also interested in having them find a way to the Spanish settlements. I think that Coulter probably communicated that idea to the Indians. The river that occurred to them as south flowing was the river that we know as the Snake. And I think that they offered to guide him across the mountains, what's now Yellowstone Park, to the south flowing uh, Snake River. In Drew Yard's map that I'll show you here in a minute, uh, he did, as I said earlier, scout the Bighorn River up as far, at least as far as Thermopolis, where the the uh, Wind River uh, goes through the Wind River Canyon and becomes the Bighorn when it comes out of its canyon. And on his map, he has two notations saying that it's 18, one, one of the notations says it's 18 days travel from where he was on the Bighorn River, 18 days travel for the Indians with their families, which probably means that they were traveling more slowly than, say, a, a party of just men out on a raiding expedition. It was only 18 days travel from there to the Spanish settlements. There's another notation on his map in a different location that says it's only eight days travel to the Spanish settlements. So it's clear that Drew Yard was looking for information on how to get to the Spanish, Spanish settlements, and that tells me that it's almost certain that Coulter was too. So back to the story of uh, John Coulter specifically, I think he went to the, the forks of the Shoshone, maybe knowing that there was an Indian camp there for the winter. Maybe his experience the previous winter with Dixon and Hancock had somehow clued him into that fact. The duplication of his route is explained that way. If he described to the Indians where he wanted to go, they would know that they could not go directly west at that season of the year across the mountains like we do on the east entrance road to Yellowstone Park over Silver and Pass. Those mountains are too high. Quite likely, they were already too snowy to, to cross at that point in probably late October, maybe even early November by then. I think that they traveled back north to the Clark Fork River and traveled up the Clark Fork River, across what we call Coulter Pass, down, and they continued on through uh, what's today Cook City, down the Lamar River. Uh, one reason I think that is that's one of the only feasible places to cross the mountains. At that time of year, the Indians certainly would have known about it. The other big clue is on Captain Clark's master maps of 1810 and 1814. He shows shows Coulter crossing, fording the Yellowstone River at what certainly appears to be somewhere near the mouth of Tower Creek. There's a really telling notation on Clark's map that says hot springs brimstone that certainly could be interpreted to be calcite springs near the mouth of Tower Creek. I think that's where Coulter crossed the river. The Indians certainly would have known if he did have Indian guides, and I think he did, the Indians certain, certainly would have known that ford. That ford became the ford across the Yellowstone for the Bannock Indian Trail, for example, that came into ex existence just uh, oh, about three decades after Coulter passed that way. The ford across the Yellowstone near Calcite Springs, near the mouth of Tower Creek. I think Coulter and his Indian guides went up and over the Washburn Mountains, maybe pretty close to the route that today's Dunraven Road follows, or possibly on some trail to the west of today's Dunraven Road. The Indians certainly would have known the way. Another reason I think that the trail that they followed might have been to the west of today's Dunraven Road is that's the way the elk migrate on their seasonal migrations to summer range to the south of the Washburns, and then again in the fall to winter range to the north of the Washburns. The elk certainly know the topography. One reason that they migrate on the route that they do just west of today's Canyon Village is, I think, to avoid Canyon Village and all the traffic. But also the tributary streams that enter the Yellowstone River to the west of today's Fishing Bridge Canyon Road, like uh, Cascade Creek, have cut deep canyons over the eons. And it doesn't make any sense if you're traveling north and south 
to have your route be close to the river because that because that means that you have to go up and down all those canyons. Whereas if you travel to the west of those canyons, like the elk do and their seasonal migrations, even today, you don't have to go up and down so much. It's a, it's a fairly level track. And my speculation is that that's the trail that Coulter's Indian guides led him on. The noteworthy difference between my interpretation of Coulter's route and the generally accepted interpretation is that I think that Coulter followed the loop of his great trek in a counterclockwise direction, if you look at a map that is oriented toward the north. The generally accepted idea is that he followed that route in a clockwise direction, that he went to the forks of the Shoshone, that's pretty well established on Captain Clark's map, and then went up the south fork of the Shoshone, crossed the mountains at the head of the south fork of the Shoshone, went down into the area of uh, what we call Jackson Hole. If you've ever been to the head of the South Fork of the Shoshone and looked at the cliffs, it's a challenge to get out of there on Forest Service trails in the summer when the ground is dry. It'd be a near impossibility to take that route, that segment of the route, in the early winter like, uh, like Coulter supposedly did. I think it would have been much more likely, much more feasible for the Indians to leave, to lead Coulter in the counterclockwise direction that, that I think he did. Uh, the ground would still have been bare or would have had minimal snow cover, especially with horses that could have jogged across what's now Yellowstone Park in pretty short order. A good day with horses for the Indians without really taxing themselves probably would have been 40 or 50 miles, so it wouldn't take that many days to cross Yellowstone Park. From the Washburn area, I think that the Indian guys led Coulter across Hayden Valley diagonally. I don't think they followed the route that we follow on today's Canyon Lake Road. I think they went to the west of that on a diagonal across Hayden Valley. Topographically, it makes sense to me to follow up Upper Trout Creek. For those of you who are familiar enough with the Hayden Valley, Upper Trout Creek lines up with a lake called, a little pond north of Yellowstone Lake called Beach Lake. And it just so happens that another creek leads away in a southerly direction from Beach Lake called Arnica Creek. There's a, a, a pretty good deal of evidence that Indians use that trail. Schematically, those two streams line up just perfectly. Indian guides would have known about the trail. And just schematically, again, it makes sense if your your destination is somewhere to the south, like uh, Jackson's Hole, the Teton Range, it makes a lot of sense to follow the hypotenuse of a triangle rather than following the two right angle legs of a triangle the way today's roads do. So I think Coulter and his Indian guides went up Upper Trout Creek to Beach Lake and down Arnica Creek. Another personal anecdote I have that lends credence to that theory is that uh, one fall, October 1986, I took a long hike by myself up Arnica Creek, and it just so happened that 1986 was a... A fall of uh, uh, they had an early onset of winter, and all the elk that had spent apparently spent the summer around the west thumb of Yellowstone Lake were heading north on Arnica Creek. I got to Beach Lake; it was pretty close to dark, so I didn't follow the elk any farther. But um, I would be willing to bet that they followed the route that I described: north past Beach Lake, north down Upper Trout Creek, and diagonally across Hayden Valley to the trail that I know they use near Canyon Village and the trail that I know they use to go over the Washburn Range. Once Coulter and his companions, his probably Shoshone companions, made it down to the mouth of Arnica Creek, they were on the west thumb of Yellowstone Lake. I think they went around the west end of Yellowstone Lake and then crossed to the west of the summit of Flat Mountain, south of Yellowstone Lake. Again, that's a, a historically documented trail. It's a trail that Osborne Russell, the famous trapper who wrote Journal of a Trapper, followed after he was ambushed by Blackfeet Indians at the mouth of Pelican Creek in 1839. He and his two companions circumnavigated the northern shore of Yellowstone Lake, went around the end of West Thumb, and then they followed that trail over the ridge to the west of the summit of Flat Mountain and down to Hart Lake. Another historical incident that took place was uh, Lieutenant Doan's uh, ill-advised winter trip through Yellowstone and Jackson Hole in the winter of 1876-77. Doan and his party went over that same ridge to the west of Flat Mountain and down to Hart Lake. From Hart Lake, I think Coulter and his party descended the Hart River to the Snake River, and then they went down the Snake River. There's a bit of evidence in the 1890s, I believe it was, a couple of hunting guides from Jackson found a tree along Coulter Creek that had the initials J.C. carved into it. 
and it's possible that it was carved by the man for whom Coulter Creek is named, no relation to the John Coulter that we're talking about. But the two hunting guides describe the, the carvings they found in that tree as being decades old, judging by the, the amount of growth of the tree since the carvings were made. And they thought that the, the carvings could have dated back eight decades. Unfortunately, the park collected that, they cut down that tree and collected that section of the of the trunk. They had the initials JC carved into it with the idea of tra transporting it to park headquarters at Mammoth. And somehow, somewhere along the way, that that chunk of, uh, of tree got lost. So we do not have that piece of evidence. But if it was made by John Coulter, it fits my idea of the route that he took across Yellowstone. From that portion of the Snake River, it's pretty clear on Captain Clark's map that John Coulter did see Jackson Lake. As most of you probably know, Jackson Lake did exist in a smaller form before the Jackson Dam was was uh, built at a much later date. Jackson Lake does appear on Captain Clark's master maps of 1810 and 1814. From there, I think Coulter and his Indian guides crossed one of the passes at the north end of the Tetons, uh, one of the passes like Conant Pass, or possibly a route that approximates today's Grassy Lake Road, the reclamation road that goes between Flag Ranch near Yellowstone South Entrance and Ashton, Idaho. There were probably a number of possible routes that they followed there. Again, we know that Conant Pass was used by Osborne Russell after he was wounded in the attack by the Blackfeet at Pelican Creek. He did cross Conant Pass on his way to uh, Fort Hall, another fur trading post where he uh, hoped to find aid to recover from his wounds, and he did. But it's established that that was a route in the early days, so Coulter and his Indians could have crossed that. That If they did cross that or cross some other route that maybe approximates the Grassy Lake Road, that would have put them into what we call the Teton Basin. And that's where I think the, the dead of winter caught up with Coulter and his Indian guys. I think Coulter holed up in what we call the Teton Basin, somewhere near Victor, Idaho, Driggs, Idaho, somewhere in there. I think that for several reasons. Topographically, there are a number of streams that drain out of the west side of the Tetons, like Lee Creek and others. Almost all the streams flow in a western direction. And because they flow to the west, that means there's a steep south-facing slope on the north side of each one of those streams that provides viable winter habitat for wintering ungulates. A lot of those streams are also spring-fed, which means there was open water in the winter, a lot of waterfowl gathered there. I have researched that point with Idaho Fish and Game, and I have it that a lot of that water still stays open today in his winter habitat for waterfowl. I bring up those two points, the possibility of wintering ungulates and the possibility of open water with waterfowl to point out that there would have been a, a food source. It's also known that the, those areas were wintering range for uh, Shoshone Indians. There's another anecdote from much later in Western history where a man named Beaver Dick Lee and his family camp there in the winter of 1876-77. Another tangent story that I think is worth relating is that Beaver Dick Lee and his wife Jenny were the ones that Jenny Lake was named for. Jenny Lake obviously named for Jenny, Beaver Dick's first wife. I have no idea what her real Shoshone Indian name was. All she's known to, to history is, uh, or is as Jenny. Beaver Dick Lee was an Englishman who came to the Teton area, spent a lot of time in what's now Yellowstone Park too. He came here apparently in the 1840s and then lived the rest of his life here. They camped there and they made a go of it through the winter in 1876-77. Uh, it's another bit of information that makes it seem like it was viable for Coulter to winter there. To continue with that sidebar story about Beaver, Beaver Dick Lee and uh, Jenny is that his family, Beaver Dick's family, was stricken by smallpox the week of Christmas in 1876. And Jenny and all six of their kids died in the span of about five days. Beaver Dick somehow picked up the pieces. I don't know how that would be possible, but he went on. He ended up marrying another Shoshone woman named Tadpole. It's an interesting story that their descendants uh, are still alive in Idaho today. Back to Coulter. We do have a bit of evidence from the Teton Basin that Coulter was there in 1807 and 1808, and that is the famous Coulter Stone. I have to admit that I believe the Coulter Stone is authentic, partially because I want to believe that, it, that it's authentic. I also think it's authentic because the farmers who found it, so it was plowed out of the ground and some land that the two Idaho farmers were clearing in the 1930s. The farmers were uneducated and they had never heard of John Coulter. 
they used the stone as a doorstop on their ranch house for a number of years before uh, National Park Service uh, employees in Grand Teton National Park heard about it, and they came and they procured the stone. It's also interesting, you can still see the Coulter Stone in the flesh uh, in a museum near Driggs, Idaho today. I think it's called the Teton Valley Museum or something to that effect. You can see it. I have photographs of it. I think that Coulter carved that stone while he was whiling away idle time in winter camp. And again, he had had that example of people carving their names and dates on stones and trees uh, during his uh, experience with Lewis and Clark. There's one particular incident that's recorded in the Lewis and Clark journals that I think is particularly pertinent to a, a carved stone on a cobble, a carving on a cobble like the Coulter Stone. It happened on November of 1805 when Lewis and Clark were searching for a place to build their winter post at the mouth of the Columbia River. Clark recruited uh, the healthy members of the party, and that's another pertinent detail about John Coulter. He was one of five members of the Lewis and Clark expedition who were never listed as being sick or injured the whole course of time that they were out. Coulter had a great deal of vitality. That aside, on this particular outing with Clark and his the healthy members of the crew in search of a location for their winter post, they came across a cliff from which a number of uh, rock or stone cobbles had tumbled. And Clark specifically records that he and his party stopped and carved their names and the dates on those stones. Clark himself definitely did it, and he said that many members of his party did. Coulter was in that party. Clark doesn't say specifically that Coulter did carve his name and date into a stone, but the other members of the, at least some of the members of the party did. I thought think it's also worthwhile to point out that evidence indicates that Coulter was literate. And the reason we know that is that he died at an early age in about 1813. His wife, Sally, put many of his possessions up for sale in an estate sale after Coulter's death. Coulter owned several books that were auctioned off at this estate sale. So why would Coulter own books if he wasn't literate? So he had, I'm pretty sure he had the ability to, to write his own name and the date at least. Another reason I I don't put much stock in that generally accepted thesis that Coulter snowshoed across Yellowstone Park is that Coulter had no exposure to snowshoes. He was born in Virginia. He grew up in Kentucky. He had no previous exposure to snowshoes. And another fascinating tidbit that I've picked up from the Lewis and Clark journals is they spent the entire winter of 1804, 1805 in what's now North Dakota living with the Mandan Indians, as I talked about earlier. And throughout the journals that winter, there's complaint after complaint about how deep the snow was in North Dakota, how hard it was to go hunt buffalo, how hard it was to go fetch the bison meat back to camp because the snow was so darn deep. There's no mention of anybody in the group using snowshoes. I can't understand that because many members of the group were French Canadian extraction. They must have been exposed to snowshoes. They must have known about snowshoes, but they did not use snowshoes. I even wrote to Gary Moulton, the editor of the most up-to-date and the best version of the Lewis and Clark journals, and asked him that question. Hey, why didn't Lewis and Clark use snowshoes when they were wading through all this snow in North Dakota? And Gary Moulton was nice enough to write back to me and say, Heck, I don't have any idea either. So there's no background for Coulter to use snowshoes. The biggest reason I think he didn't cross the Yellowstone Plateau in the dead of winter is that there wasn't anything to eat. There were probably no wintering ungulates. And this is a depiction of the generally accepted uh, story of, of Lewis and his trek through the mountains, that he's on snowshoes and alone. This is a painting by a, a very famous uh, Western artist named John Clymer, who died quite a long time ago, like 1976, 77, I think. But this is supposedly John Coulter meeting, meeting the crows in the South Fork of the Shoshone. And again, John Coulter had no, apparently had no background or no knowledge of uh, snowshoes. And I think it's preposterous to think that he could have snowshoed across Yellowstone Park by himself without guides, no matter how capable he was. There's no way he could have known the route. He didn't have any background in, in dealing with a, a deep snow environment, the Yellowstone Park is. This is an even more fanciful uh, painting of supposedly Coulter in what's now Yellowstone Park. I personally do not think that he went to the went through the Great Geyser Basins on the west side of Yellowstone Park. I think there would have been a notation of the Great Geysers on uh, Clark's map if he had gotten the information from Coulter and the, whoever painted this painting. I'm not one to throw rocks at people, but Whoever painted it didn't do much research. This does not look much like the Fire Hole River to me. The tree species are different than the ones you see in the geyser basins. John Coulter's on snowshoes again. Um, 
leading pack horses. Pack horses would be useless. It would be impossible to get through central Yellowstone in the winter with horses. And again, I don't think there was anything for Coulter to eat on his trek across Yellowstone. Uh, even in the geyser basins at that time, there probably weren't very many winter, wintering ungulates. Winters in Yellowstone were much harsher than they are now because of the little ice age and uh, the presence of ungulates in the geyser basins. It probably is an artifact of our presence that we came into the park, killed off the wolves. Elk and bison began to discover that they could make a go of it in the geyser basins. The elk at least really disappeared from the geyser basins when wolves came back. I don't think that there were that many wintering ungulates in the geyser basins in Coulter's time. This is one of my photographs of Cascade Creek near Canyon Village um, that, that shows uh, how much snow there is in central Yellowstone in the dead of winter. It'd be even hard to get a drink of water out of the stream with snow that deep. This is a shot of mine of the of the Washburn Range in the middle of the winter. And this is a shot of the ungulates that used to live, the elk that used to live in the Firehole Basin that they don't live there now. The wolves made pretty short work of them after the wolves came back in the mid-90s. By the mid-2000 aughts, the elk were pretty much gone from the geyser basins, certainly by the late 2000 aughts. And this was a picture of frozen Yellowstone Lake with the Absaroka Mountains. Again, I think it had been very, very difficult for somebody who didn't know where he was going, who didn't have any experience in a deep snow environment, to cross the Yellowstone Plateau in the dead of winter. This is a picture of Carrington Island in the west sum of Yellowstone Lake, frozen Yellowstone Lake with Mount Sheridan. Again, really harsh conditions. This is a picture of the Tetons. There's not much doubt, according to Captain Clark's map, that John Coulter did see the Tetons in Jackson Lake. This is frozen Jackson Lake in the foreground and a very wintry Teton range in the background. I think he had to cross the Tetons at the north end of the Tetons and before real winter set in. And my thesis is that uh, he did come through Lamar Valley. This is a shot of Lamar Valley in the fall when it would be possible to ride horses through there. It's cold, it's frosty, Lamar River is steaming, but there isn't any snow to obstruct the way. And this is a picture of what I think uh, Bolter saw when he w went around the west end of Yellowstone Lake, the west thumb of Yellowstone Lake, with ice beginning to form on the lake. This picture was taken near the Potts Thermal Area early in the winter. This is a picture by Edward Sheriff Curtis, the famous photographer of Indians in the late 19th century. I guess it was the early 20th century. Crow Indians is probably one of the groups that Manuel Lisa wanted uh, his scouts to make contact with, if he had made contact with them already. It's a shot of uh, Shoshone Indians by William H. Jackson. Indians that Coulter would have known uh, from his previous experience with Lewis and Clark. That's the great Shoshone chief Washakie in the center of the frame with the hat in his hands. Washakie was a fascinating individual who was born about 1797, 1799, somewhere in there at a time when the Shoshones had never seen a white person. And he lived till 1901, I think, over 100 years old. So he lived from that that situation where no white people had ever been in the homeland of the Shoshones to probably see in automobiles by the time he died. And this is my outline of uh, what I think is John Coulter's route, the directional air arrows showing the direction he went. This map, again, is not big enough to show detail. I do think that he carved the Coulter tree in, uh, along Coulter Creek in southern, extreme southern Yellowstone, which would be south of Hart Lake, which is marked on this map. The Coulter Stone, the, the site of the Coulter Stone is depicted here. To finish the story, I think Coulter did spend most of the winter in the Teton Basin. And then come spring, I think he traveled south in the Teton Basin and he crossed what now is um, we call Teton Pass. I think he went north through what we call Jackson Hole and over Togety Pass down to the Wind River Valley, the Wind River. I think he then went back to the forces of the Shoshone returned his Indian guides to their village, maybe returned the horses. There's no way to know. And from there, it was an easy matter for him to retrace his outward bound journey back to Manuel Lisa's fort. I think if, if Coulter timed his departure from his winter camp in the Teton Basin, he could have crossed uh, the high elevation snow country like Teton Pass. Early in the morning, in the early spring, sometime in the spring, uh, for those of you who have experience in deep snow environments, there is a period of time in the spring when the snow softens and moistens in the warm days, mid days of spring. And then 
freezes very, very hard, oftentimes very, very hard at night in the, the cold nights of spring. Many times I've seen the snow crust up to the point where I've been able to walk across it. And I've even seen large bull bison walk on top of four or five feet of snow when it's crusted up. Again, if Coulter had Indian guys, they would have known about that phenomenon regarding the snow in the spring. And they might have even advised him to not try to cross high elevation, deep snow environments until that time in the spring arrived. If he did time it correctly, I think he could have walked an up, up and over Teton Pass on top of the crust, might have even been able to take his horses up and over the crust. Another thing to be pointed out, when he crossed high elevation, deep snow environments like Teton Pass and Togety Pass, in both cases, he was crossing high elevation snowy environments, yes, but it was a narrow band of deep snow environment. It's not that far from the Teton Basin, uh, like where Victor, Idaho is today, down to Jackson's Hole, where the town of Jackson is now. And from there, it would be somewhat reduced snow environment as he traveled north in the in uh, Jackson's Hole. Again, he crossed a deep snow environment on Togety Pass. Uh, again, he could have crossed it on crusty snow. I will say about Togety Pass, that the west side of Togety Pass develops a deep snowpack in the winter. As soon as you cross that pass and you start to descend in elevation, you very, very quickly get out of the deep snow. Uh, most of the precip precipitation falls on the west side of the pass. Very little falls at the head of the R Wind River on the east side of the pass. So once you got across that pass, it would be pretty easy for him to get back to the low elevation Wind River Valley, the Bighorn Basin, both areas are in the Chinook Belt. There have been reduced snow cover. There have been uncountable ungulates out there for him to hunt and to eat as he made his way back to the forks of the Shoshone. The same would have been true on his trip from the forks of the Shoshone back to Manimal's Fort at the mouth of the Bighorn. Plenty of animals, uh, limitless ungulates to eat in those days. So that's my spiel. I apologize if, if I forgot any pertinent points. Again, if you would like to get a, a better view of Captain Clark's map of 1814 or his map of 1810, you can do so through the Library of Congress online and look at those maps in detail. You can also find George Driard's sketch map, which I think is key to my argument about how Coulter traversed the Yellowstone country. You can find that map at the Missouri Historical Society. And again, it's a map of high resolution. You can zoom in and see fine detail. And I guess that's all I have to say today. And I thank you all very much for bearing with me. I hope that uh, you enjoyed my talk. And uh, thanks to George and Jenny for putting on this program.